It's so wonderful to be here. If we could open up our Bibles in Luke 15, you know, it's so wonderful the way you guys create such an atmosphere because it creates such an anticipation for the word. You know, so many restaurants spend so much money on atmosphere because they want you to anticipate the entree. So it's so wonderful because I've had to teach my church that if you come in with the right attitude, you will receive. Yeah. So Luke 15, 21 through 23, when you have it, say amen. Again, we are family, and I'm so grateful again to be here. And my family is so grateful too, so they say hi. Uh -huh. <laughs> Um, Luke 15, 21 through 23. I have the New International Version. And I know this is a very familiar text. But I want us to grab something from this. Um, and it says, The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy of to be called your son. How many know we're, none of us are worthy? Oh, not too many amens. How many know none of us are worthy to be called his son? But, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. So I want to talk today about the importance of a connection, okay? I want to, against the importance of a connection, okay? Can you pray with me? Yes. So thank you, God, for this moment, that you created this moment for us to be here, to worship you, and to learn from you. And because we know your spirit is real and is with us, inside of us, and you're moving along with us, you are creating, Lord, but it's going to be a big event. We believe in what you do and what you've done in our lives. Thank you, Jesus Christ. Amen. So I think we know as a church by now how important it is to be connected. Amen. So I need us to know the importance of who we are connected to. Okay. I'm going to repeat. It's very important who we are connected to. As a church, there are two connections when we come to church. The vertical one, which is with God, and then the horizontal one with the body. Okay? So there is a vertical and a horizontal connection. Again, our connection will determine our success and our failure. Okay. And, and this is so important. Our connections will determine our successes and our failures. In Ecclesiastes, it says, uh, chapter 4, verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return with for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them. Okay? So pity the person that is not connected. I remember there was a word trifling. Very sad is the person that is not connected because Jesus is about connection. How many understand that? And more than anything I've learned in my life, it's such a blessing to be connected. It's a blessing. The body cannot function if it's not connected. Okay? So our function is dependent on our connection. If you're not functioning right, you should evaluate if you're connected to the body. Okay, so that's important. So our function is dependent on our connection. For the body of Christ to function, we must be connected to the body. Okay, uh, mind you, I didn't say we have to be in agreement. Okay, because if you're connected, you will come to an agreement. And some people will say, I'm in agreement, but you're not connected. So it's more important to be connected. I heard of a presentation about the epidemic of addiction. And they said, what should we do to help the addicts, people that have addictions? 
They said we criminalize it, and then we shame them, and it's only made it worse. Right? So they, they found a program that's been successful in Portugal, and they gave opportunities to the addicts to connect with society, to become productive, so then they can get a self-worth. The conclusion of it was this. The key to addiction or to overcome addiction is connection. Yeah. The key to our freedom was the connection to Jesus Christ. Oh, I need us to, that, that should be a holler moment. The reason we're no longer addicts, the reason sin doesn't dominate us anymore is our connection with Jesus Christ. So the key to our growth is our connection with Jesus Christ and each other. Okay. I, I need, my connection will determine my success or failure. I, I, can be, I am so grateful to Triumph in Church because I know that part of our success of my church, Temple Cristiano, is because of the connection I have with you guys. I'm going to share the story since your dad's not here. Because <laughs> it's about him. We're, when we were looking for a place, and, it, and, and we, we saw this place, and they said, you have to go through this interview process. They made me go through a lot of hoops, and they still weren't sure. They said, uh, we're still determining if you should come here. And I said, that's fine. Um, but they made one call to your pastor, to your dad, to your Rogers. And then I didn't know what made them say yes. And then later on, when it was inauguration service and Pastor Rogers went, they said, He's the reason you're here. <laughs> the connection with him. Yes. See, and the thing is, if you're not connected, you are disconnected. Yes, yes. So, uh, you know, some people get lo locked into watching a certain series. They used, to say, they used to call them soaps, you know, but it's the same thing. So they watch a certain series. So now the thing is, they won't miss an episode. They will rearrange their schedule. They will make sure they record it because they don't want to miss one, two, three, or four episodes. Because if they miss it, when you come back, you're puzzled and you think, oh, my God, when did they get married? Oh my, well, how come they have three children all of a sudden? What happened is because you were disconnected. And that's why when you miss services... Yes, that's why when you miss an episode, a service, you are disconnected and you're like, what happened? Because you didn't come consistently. You are disconnected. And I'm not here to shame you, but I'm here to remind you that every week God is doing something and you want to be connected to that. Yeah, at the ending of most shows, they will say, stay tuned. In other words, it's stay tuned connected how many understanding the importance of a connection yes it is so important now let me go give you the other side it's so dangerous for you to be disconnected as pastors we worry when our one of our sheep or one of our members is disconnected it's very, I was almost about to call it the dangers of being disconnected. There's nothing more dangerous for a believer to be disconnected from the body. Yeah. Because you can't be just you and God and have church. Yeah. The whole body is the church. So be, it's so dangerous for us to be disconnected. And some people feel like they're disconnected from God. But it's not because he disconnected himself from you. You disconnected yourself from him. I read something that says, if you feel that God is far away, it's not because he moved. You did. I, I don't feel him anymore. He's right there. So in this famous passage of the prodigal, now let's go to the Bible. The famous uh, passage of the, uh, of the prodigal, there is a connection that's established. There's a connection between the father and the son. This is what we call a blood connection. There are some blood connections we have that we may choose to deny. Nobody? Nobody has that crazy uncle? Or grandfather? Yes, I do. Okay. So 
The blood, there's blood connections that we choose to deny. And you, but you can't remove the fact that you're connected to them by blood. So we'll try to deny the connection. Some people will even take a blood test. And the blood test will determine the connection. Okay? Because it's in the blood connection that we find our identification. Oh, I got to get that. Okay. It's in the blood connection that we find our identification. It's through the connection of the blood of Jesus Christ that we find our identification. Yeah. I, I used to reject and deny my connection with my dad, but there was no way denying it. All they had to look at was our faces. There was no blood needed to test to find that out. So the blood connection gives me rights. How many are grateful for the rights? It also gives me benefits. And this prodigal son, this young man, knew the rights and benefits that he had. He knew he had rights. But just because you have rights as a son, it doesn't give you the right to be disrespectful. That's really important because now he, th he thinks you can come to me whenever you want. But he was disrespectful because he was asking for his inheritance. And the father wasn't even dead yet. That was very disrespectful, especially in those times. So now the father has to give it to him because he knows the son has rights. And because he was young, I understand that he was immature. But he was also rebellious. And the most destructive combo for anyone is to be immature and to be rebellious. Anybody? And I'm going to tell you, you can be old and be immature. Yes? Yes. So that's a destructive combo. Because, he, because of his immaturity, he spent his money recklessly. How many are immature in their spending? Or done some immature spending. Mm. You see there's no age limit for that? Yes. We can do some immature spending because it's an emotional spending. It's an impulsive thing. You're not thinking maturely. You're not using God's wisdom to spend. But his was worse because he was rebellious. And now he's spending his money that knew in ways that would go against the, the way the father established it. Yes. So he was spending his money recklessly. Now he's saying, I am independent. And it's my money. So I can do whatever I want with it. And you know what? In a way, he's right. It's his money. Even though it was the father's, really. But it's his money. So now he can do whatever he wants with it. But the, this is the problem. You can spend all the money recklessly if you want to. But the consequences you will pay for also. If you choose to cross all the red lights, you must pay all the tickets. Are we in agreement with that? Yes. So this is the thing. He ended up, this young Jewish boy, ended up with, well, and we know how the story ends up, he ends up with the pigs. Okay? And in the Jewish culture, this has great significance. In spiritual terms, it also has great significance because he hits rock bottom. This is a sinful state. Okay, this this is a lost state and this is and it's not so much where he ended up. It's how he ended up. That's very dangerous. Okay, because it's not so much the place. It's now his state of mind. His state of mind. He is completely disconnected. He was misspending his inheritance. So now he's disconnected. He was rebellious. So now he's disconnected. And here is the problem. When you're disconnected, the devil takes the opportunity to mess with your mind. Yes. How many can say amen with that? Yes. See, he is now entering into an identity crisis. And that is the danger of being disconnected. 
It's not so much what happens to your body. It's what's happening to your soul that's the problem. Now he has an identity crisis because he says, I am not worthy to be called your son. That means I don't deserve to be called your son. Again, how many know none of us deserve, deserve to be called this son? But this is the problem. He no longer sees himself as a son. He sees himself as a slave. Yes. So now you can put me in the slave quarters. Now, because I didn't behave like a son, I tarnished your name. Call me a slave because as a slave, I don't carry your name. I carry whatever name you put on me. So now as a slave, I no longer have rights. I no longer have benefits. I'm considered only property. Do you see how dangerous that is? Because we say we are the children and the sons and daughters of God. But when we go out there, sin makes us believe we're no longer the sons of God. And even when we sin, we are still the sons and daughters of God. But we must continue to be connected. So now here's the danger because he's entering what we call an identity crisis. The son is stating, I can no longer carry your name. I am not worthy of carrying your name. I will accept anything you give to me. He's humbling himself. And see, this is, this is the wonderful thing of this passage because the dad knows his son is going through an identity crisis. He's going through an because look at verse 22. Call me, don't call me son no more. He's saying, call me slave. Treat me like one. And his dad says, nope, here's a bigger problem. Because in verse 22, he says, quickly, he tells the servants, bring him a robe. The father knows his son is going through an identity crisis, and he says, we have to take him to the ID emergency room. We must reestablish his identity because this is the problem. Now he's accepting anything. Yeah. Bring him the best robe. The best robe. Now, let me tell you why this is so significant. Because he was, where did he come from? From the pigs. He smelled like pig. And see, in the Jewish culture, see, I love pig. But in the Jewish culture, see, we have something called pupusas, okay? Pupusas, anybody know pupusas? Okay, so pupusas, you put a little pig in it, oh, it's so delicious. And you smell it, and it's so good. But for the Jewish culture, that was something unclean. So immediately they smell pig, they're like, oh, no. Oh, no, stay away from it. That is sinful. Not for me, but for them, it was horrible. I'm going to tell you to what degree they would almost vomit just to think that pig was around. And his son comes smelling like pig. Let me put it in spiritual terms. He comes smelling like sin. I don't know if you know, but sometimes you can smell sin. All right, let's wake up. Sometimes, sometimes you can smell the sin coming. Yes. So he's filthy. He's unclean. He smells like sin. He smells like a slave to sin. And his, and his father says, grab the robe. We need to dress him. I need to cover him because I'm going to get his filthiness and cover him with my holiness. Oh, how many are grateful to God for that? See, this doesn't make me clean. His holiness makes me clean. So he knows his son is a disgrace. And he knows he's visible to others. His disgrace is visible to others. And the wonderful thing about the father, he says, let's cover him up. But, but this is the thing. He's still struggling because, no, he's like, no, no, 
no, don't dress me like that. You know I don't deserve it. You know I'm still, I still have this slave mentality. You know I'm not the son. Yes, I know on papers I am your son. But the father says, no, we need to restore his identity. And so I'm going to dress him up. And when you come to church and accept Christ, he dresses you up. So he's just, he's just prepping the son because the son still doesn't believe it. The son is still like, you don't know what I did yesterday. You don't know who I was with yesterday. You don't know what I did with all the money and opportunities you gave me. I wasted it all because that's what prodigal means, wasting everything. So he's struggling. He's struggling with his, ID, his identity, and the dad sees that, and he knows that. And he says, my son still doesn't believe he's my son. And you know what? You can be in church 10 years, and you still don't believe that you're the son and daughter of God. Isn't it? Yeah, you're coming like, oh, God. You come with your failures. You come knowing your past and that image that the devil tries to bring to your head every time and try to say you're worthless. That's why you don't belong here. But God says, I'm going to dress you up and I'm going to restore your identity. And because the son is struggling, the next thing he says, shh, shh, stop talking. No, I know you're saying I'm worthy. I don't want to hear it anymore. You're my son. So where you brought the robe, the next thing we have to bring is a ring. Let's bring a ring because we're losing him. He's on the table. You know how the ER is? They're like, let's count the minutes. Okay, let's start pumping him because we're about to lose my son. He's coming filthy. I dressed him, but let's give him a ring. A ring represents authority. How many know that God has given us authority? Oh, how many are grateful that God has given you authority? He's giving him a ring, and he's telling him, you now are no longer a slave. You have power over things that you didn't have power before. How many are grateful that you have authority over things that you didn't have authority before? Yes. So he's giving him the ring. In, in 2 Timothy 1.7, it says he gives us power, love, and self-discipline. He gives us. He gives us. You can try to do a 10-step program to get better and be disciplined, but God gives us the self-discipline. If you remain connected. So he gives them the ring. And he says, I'm giving you authority. I don't want you to say you're powerless. In me, you are powerful. How many know we're powerful in God? Yes, we are powerful in God. I know there are images that cross your mind that you feel they still control you. But God says, look at the ring. You have authority over those images. And he's still saying, I'm not worthy. God, I'm not worthy. Look what I've done. Father, no, no, no. Don't put me in the good room. Don't even tell me that I'm going into the house. And he gave him the ring. And now he says, bring out the sandals. See, it's, it's time for sandal, right? It's season for sandals. But sandals had a great significance then because sandals were only worn by people that lived in the house. If you were a slave, you were barefoot. So obviously he comes in already as an identification as a slave, and the father says, you are not slave here no more. You are my son, and I'm going to make you believe it. Because we forget. But he grabs the sandals, and he's struggling, and he says, I'm giving you authority, but now I'm going to put these sandals on your feet because we need to restore your identification. If something you can get today is that God came to restore our identification. Yes, it's our D. I, I, I know uh, it seems significant what's happened to us, but it's very significant what he did for us. So the father has gone through this process, putting on the robe, putting on the ring, also now putting on the sandals. So now he says, bring out the fatted calf. In other terms, let's party. My son is back. But see, this is more than just a celebration. 
Look in verse 23. It says, bring the fatted calf and kill it. That's in our version. In the original version, the Greek version, is let's sacrifice it. There's a difference. You kill something to eat it, but when you sacrifice it, it's to make a pact. How many understanding this? I want you to get this. Because now let's say the son gets a little too happy to be son again. Yeah. Let's say he's like, okay, okay, now I'm believing I'm son. Look at me. Look how I'm dressed. You gave me authority. I can speak on behalf of the father now. And now I have these sandals that separate me from anyone else, separates me from the slaves. But he says, let's bring out the fatted calf. And something so wonderful is that I believe is that that fatted calf was being prepared for the son before he even made it back home. I mean, do you know what I'm saying? They were fattening that that calf. They were like, when he comes back, this is for him. That means that sacrifice had his name on it. The same with Jesus Christ. That cross, that sacrifice had your name on it. How many can say glory to God for that? So that calf had his name on it. And that sacrifice has our name on it. And before we celebrate and before we party, he tells them, okay, I'm bringing your idea, son, back. But now what we have to do is make a sacrifice. Because whenever there's sin, there has to be a sacrifice. They can't just say you're forgiven. Blood has to be shed. And that's why there's a contradiction of the cross, because the cross represents the greatest injustice in humanity. Because I know there are some innocent men that have suffered in this world, but no one like Jesus Christ. Because even though maybe I didn't commit a crime, something in my history deserved the punishment. Amen to that? But Jesus Christ, not one day, not one second was he a criminal or guilty of committing a crime. So now he's at the cross completely innocent of sin. That's the injustice of the cross. But there's justice in heaven. This is... This is the duality of the cross because there's injustice in the land, but justice in heaven. Because the Father says, for every sin, there must be a sacrifice. And it cannot be just any sacrifice. My parents could not die for me because they're criminals too. You can't take someone's place because you are a criminal too. How many can admit to that? doesn't matter the level the level of sin that you've done but we've all broken God's laws so I can't take anyone's place my parents can't take my place the pastor can't take your place to really have justice of sin there has to be a perfect clean lamb and that lamb must shed his blood So before the son gets a little too happy that now that the dad says, you're my son, I'm going to let you know we have to make a sacrifice. So he grabs the fatted calf, and the fatted calf has such great significance. the, The biggest parties, the best parties have packs in them. Is that correct? Like a marriage. This is not let's just party because they're together. This is her saying, I'm no longer your girlfriend, I'm your wife. I'm no longer your boyfriend, I'm your husband. So that means I don't look at anybody else. Okay, yes, yes. Okay. In in the Spanish culture, they have something called quinceaneras. Okay, I think like sweet 16. So in our version, it looks like a big wedding. So what they're telling is you're no longer a little girl, you're a young lady. So that means you, you can cook and clean now. <laughs> yes. So we're going to have a big party, but there's a condition to this party. Okay? The best parties have conditions on it. 
There's a demand now because now you graduated, I expect you to be independent. So now that we're going to have this big party, I want you to know there's a condition to this party. Because he's saying we're going to sacrifice this calf that was prepared for you. But I want you to remember this is a pact. This isn't you just coming home and thank God I'm home. This is you coming home and staying home. Yeah. We are grateful for all the prodigals that come and go and come and go and come and go. But the prodigal that truly comes has to stay in the house and has to stay connected. And that's why it's so dangerous for you not to be connected because you come and you're disconnected, so you go. And then you connect again and you come and you disconnect and then you go. But what the father's trying to tell the son is you're not leaving anymore. You're missing too many episodes. Yeah. This is a, this is a wake up for some of us. Yes. Yes. You have to be connected because God is doing something new in triumphant church and you're going to miss the new for being disconnected. And I'm going to tell you, this could happen to leaders too. Yeah. What I have chosen to do is when I see the person that's getting disconnected, we will encourage them. But at the same time, that should not stop me from doing what I need to do. Yeah, Because the church is going to still function. The church is going to still do whatever God wants. And when you come back and you'll be like, okay, so where do I belong? I don't know where you belong. You're still part of the body, but we'll see where we put you. But at the same time, the church must continue to work. Yeah. So James 4, 8, it says, come close to God, and God will come close to you. How many are grateful for that? And it says, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. That's what disconnects us when our loyalty is in with God. And I know that if you're loyal to God, you're going to be loyal to your pastor and your church. Yep. It's okay not everybody saying amen because I don't expect that reaction. Yeah. See, when I, I'm, it's funny because the, the thing that I do the most or did the most for a long time was couples counseling. And they're like, so what can, what's the secret? What do we do? Connect to God. If you want to be a better husband, connect to God and you will love her more. I can't give you how to love her more. But if you love God more, you're going to treat her right. And every woman should desire a godly husband. Because if you have a godly husband, he will treat you right. It's the connection. We want you to be connected. Now, I went to Spain about a year and a half ago. It was not the best experience. You know, because I guess I wasn't Spanish enough. Uh, my, my Spanish is very street. And they're very proper. And they could tell from a mile away I didn't belong there. So I didn't get the best reception. So what I dis and I felt disconnected. And it started to even get a little dark for me because I went by myself. And there was one moment I said, I know what I need to do. And it was lock myself away for a day just to be with God. And I did that. And then the next day I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fulfill one of my dreams, which is going to go see Lion King live. Because mm -hmm. it's too expensive over here. So I was like, I'm going to go there to the, the palace auditorium. And it was a lot cheaper. And I'm going to go see it. And there was this scene, you know, where Simba sinned and left. Yep. And no longer the sun. And then when he was out in the wilderness, the spirit of Mufasa shows up. And then the voice says, remember. I'm trying to do my impersonation of. So he goes, remember. And he's saying, remember. And he says, remember who I am. Because if you remember who I am, 
you will remember who you are. Are you getting what I'm saying? When I was there, it, it was like I was in service. I was like, oh, thank you, God. I don't care about these heathens that don't believe in you. I am so wonderful. I am wonderfully made and created by you. I am your son. I can have church, and I will find a church here, and I will connect myself again because I remembered who I was. Depression comes in when you forget who you are. That's what needed to happen. And I am so grateful to God for those moments that he reminds me. He reminds me. Oh, you know how I came out praising the Lord from that auditorium. I know those people were happy for other reasons. But I was happy to receive a word because you can get a word anywhere. He will remind you anywhere. And that's what he did with the prodigal son. He was deep in sin. And then here comes the reminder. And I came here to remind you that that fatted calf, that sacrifice has your name on it. And that filthiness, you came here feeling filthy. No one knows because now you have your best dress on. But inside, you feel filthy. God's going to cover that filthiness. My church this season has gotten quite a few members that are struggling with alcoholism. And they're doing it quietly. And once they told me, I was like, why didn't you tell me before? I was so ashamed. Don't be. God's going to give you the ring of authority over that alcoholism. God is going to give you that ring of authority over that sin that you think you can't leave. How many are grateful that God has given you authority over things? So I'm so grateful when God does those reminders. How many sons and daughters are here? Yes, yes. Can we stand up? <laughs>